Uh, there is an opportunity for artificial intelligence to be a breakthrough technology, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And there's also an availability for people to oversee how AI is used yeah. in different places to ensure that the right jobs are kept and people have access to their data and information and can keep it safe. When you go to your local store and you have a self-checkout, that self-checkout is analyzing your face through facial recognition. That's mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. And what it does is it scans your face to identify who you are associated with your credit card that you're using. A lot of people don't know that. Now, it's really important for you to know and for you to really understand that artificial intelligence is being used in multiple places. So when you have self-checkouts at the grocery store, your face is being scanned in artificial intelligence. Now, will jobs be lost? It depends on how society chooses to regulate how this artificial intelligence is to be used. Yeah. And you know that saying? that if you see something that needs to be done and no one's doing it, then perhaps it should be you. <laughs> What's up, you guys? It's your girl, Bianca B. And welcome to the Bianca B Show, where we talk about business, finances, and friendships. I'm super excited about our next guest. She is an award-winning science author and former NASA rocket scientist. I'm super excited to have her on. It's Olympia LaPointe. How are you? Uh, I am well. How are you? It is my pleasure to be on your show. Awesome. And so I was doing a little research on you and your story on how you became a rocket scientist is incredible to me because you were like the normal girl who grew up in, you know, LA and California and just like, you know, your environment. So I kind of just want to get a backstory of, you know, for those who don't know you, how you became a rocket scientist. Oh, well, Thank you so much. A lot of people don't know that I am a former award-winning rocket scientist who helped launch 28 NASA space shuttles into space and now the founder of my platform, AnswersUnleashed.com. And a lot of people do not know that I grew up in South Central Los Angeles in the 1980s and the 1990s in the height of the gang violence and the drug trafficking. And I had to find a way to educate myself to change my future. And it was a field trip. When I was six years old, I went to the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and there I saw the rocket engines and I saw these pictures of men launching rockets. And I told myself I wanted to be just like these men, not knowing how challenging it was going to be going in that route and on that path and through much prayer and through mentors and people who helped me along the way I changed my failing scores from the fails in algebra and geometry calculus and chemistry and I learned to reprogram my mind from the trauma and the the fear so I could then take control of my life, take back my life through my decision-making. And that led me to uh, graduate and enter California State University, Northridge, where I studied mathematics. And I studied mathematics for my bachelor's and my master's degree. And I later was hired into an aer aerospace company. And at the aerospace company, I was helping launch rockets. <laughs> and this is the the rockets that we see, uh, what we saw, the space shuttle, it's at several museums now. And I, along with a team of people sat in mission control, supporting the ROS, which was the Rocketdyne Operations Support Center. And we helped launch the space shuttle. And it was an amazing feat and I loved it. And I did not know how important STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics was until I was in the mission control room looking around and I realized that almost everyone was going to retire. And I was the youngest person there. And I made this decision at that moment in time. I thought to myself, who's gonna go into promoting science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the future if everyone's going to retire? Yeah. And you know that saying? that if you see something that needs to be done and no one's doing it, then perhaps it should be you. <laughs> well, in my case, I realized I 
I could communicate the science. Mm -hmm. I could express it. I went through my own challenges with it and I, I launched rockets with the mathematics and the science. And so I decided to uh, leave rocket science, start my company and go into teaching as a math professor and then create my Answers Unleashed educational books to help people overcome their fear of mathematics and help them understand science so they can find innovative solutions for the future. And so I'm very happy because I didn't have the the stellar background that some people may expect mm -hmm. a rocket scientist to have. Rather, I had the like the the only from the block type <laughs> of background where I learned to be able to take the tough situations and apply the lessons I learned in that to science so I could create innovation. And so that's what I help people do through my Answers Unleashed book series. I love that. Just the backstory of that and, you know, your upbringing and just being a woman and being in that field, you know, I can totally relate being in the film industry and sometimes being the only woman. And uh, I just admire you and your backstory about that. So we want to talk about artificial intelligence. That's a big topic of this generation. And even as a millennial, just seeing the progression of the digital space. So first and foremost, what is AI? And um, like, for those who don't know, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure people know, but just the backstory of artificial intelligence. Newest type of technology, which is artificial intelligence. Now, surprisingly enough, artificial intelligence has been around since 1980, but it's just recently in the pandemic that did a new type of artificial intelligence come out called generative artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give us a quick background to understand artificial intelligence so everyone will know what it is. Artificial intelligence is a way for computers to be able to take data and information and create patterns and information from the data and information to give you an output, which is an answer. Mm -hmm. Now, there's different types of artificial intelligence. There's the traditional artificial intelligence that started in 1980, and that takes a look at pictures and reads pictures to be able to tell you information. For example, the earliest type of artificial intelligence was the ATM machine. When we put in our checks in the ATM, and then it would read how much money was on the check, yeah. That was artificial intelligence. It would tell us information based on pictures and imaging. Then it went to fax machines and then printing machines. And then it later went on to your Google Maps. So when you talk into your Google Maps, you can get to another place or you talk to Siri, it will tell you directions. And then there was, through that type of large amount of data, there was a different type of artificial intelligence that was created called predictive AI. Mm -hmm. And predictive artificial intelligence is when you look at a large amount of data, whether it be weather data across the world or a size, a seismology, the data of how the ground shakes or looking at the stock market, there's so much data involved. You have to be able to categorize it and make sense of it. So artificial intelligence was a fast computing system that allowed people to make predictions off of large amounts of data. So uh, weather forecasts are predicted from artificial intelligence. Uh, when there's cybersecurity issues, it's identified through artificial intelligence. So we have different ways in which artificial intelligence is used. It's also used to predict cancers when mm -hmm. the traditional imaging systems cannot be able to identify it in the bloodstream. So this artificial intelligence was taken from large amounts of data from various places, from the stock market, from, from Google, from um, uh, facial recognition, which is on, on Facebook and, yeah. and Instagram and all these other social media outlets. Then the pandemic happened. Yeah. And right before the pandemic, three scientists won the Nobel Peace Prize. It was the Turning Award for their artificial intelligence work. These were the three people that were developing it since 1980. And what they did was found a way for the artificial intelligence to look at all this data through large language models, which is a mathematics that takes large amounts of data and processes it and gives you an output. Now, generative artificial intelligence was created in the pandemic and after the the 
Turing Award was received. What artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence does is that instead of there being a programmer that will program a code for an output to be created, right. generative AI creates an output based on the data. Got it. And the data is pictures. The data is voice. The data is text. And this all came about in the pandemic when everyone was using their computers and their graphic cards to be able to do video conferencing to communicate with everyone across the world. Wow. These graphic chips, whether it be Intel, NVIDIA, or other type of graphics cards, had to contain data of images. Yeah. Every single frame of video had to be stored somewhere, and that data had to be analyzed. Well, artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence, was applied to all of this visual data, text data, voice data that was going across the world during the pandemic. And that data then generated what we call large language models, yeah. which is the mathematics that looks at all these detailed type of analysis of pictures and text and voice images and, and voice messages and puts it together in a one constructed way. Well, this artificial intelligence, generative artificial intelligence is what we see in the news today. Yeah. Now, the good part about this is that it's a fast calculating system that allows someone to be able to get information quickly from pictures and images but here's the bad part if you have incorrect data going into the model or false assumptions in the mathematical model based on uh let's say uh people's appearance or their voice or incorrect information that's being accessed online or other places it goes into the model and it gives you a false output so you can have really great outputs from the new type of generative AI that's out there, and you can have horribly wrong information because there's nobody checking the output like there was before right. when there was a programmer taking the data. You know, what's so interesting about that is, you know, seeing, especially during the pandemic, I would see like with DoorDash or it was either DoorDash or GrubHub. It would be like these little robots. They would take you to you take your food to you. That's when I noticed like, oh, OK, the world is changing now. And then also with, you know, when you go to the store, even like Target, there's no employees. So my concern for that is, will people lose their jobs? Will AI replace jobs? Yes and no. Hmm. Yes and no. Uh, there is an opportunity for artificial intelligence to be a breakthrough technology, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And there's also an availability for people to oversee how AI is used yeah. in different places to ensure that the right jobs are kept and people have access to their data and information and can keep it safe. When you go to your local store and you have a self-checkout, that self-checkout is analyzing your face through facial recognition. That's mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. And what it does is it scans your face to identify who you are associated with your credit card that you're using. A lot of people don't know that. And Amazon has that, uh, other places have that with the self-checkout. And this data is actually stored. Now, it's really important for you to know and for you to really understand that artificial intelligence is being used in multiple places. So when you have self-checkouts at the grocery store, your face is being scanned in artificial intelligence. Now, will jobs be lost? It depends on how society chooses to regulate how this artificial intelligence is to be used. Mm -hmm. Now, I have great faith in the future. I, I'm a person who prays and I'm a person who believes in God and that's everyone's different yeah that's what I believe yeah, I truly yeah. believe that with every single type of technology that exists and that is developed we as a humanity and we as humans have the ability to create a structure to how this technology could be used in a safe way and that is the the beautiful part about the human brain and our inventive solution finding power right when we find ways to be able to to use technology in a way that's helpful that is most uh, important 
there are scientists right now that are arguing in in making sure that there are standards and policies placed forth with artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. uh, Sam Altman from OpenAI recently went to the Senate and proposed three different actions for the Senate to consider. Uh, yeah. Number one, it was to create a regulatory agency to give licenses to the companies that use your data, you use your face, use your uh, fingerprint, use your voice, and have laws to identify how your information will be used and the ways in which it will be used. The second type of uh, recommendation that was presented was that artificial intelligence, once it starts learning too much information, mm -hmm. You shut it down and create something new so it doesn't take over jobs and it doesn't take over information that doesn't give false information or override some of the basic systems in which we have in place as humans. And the third recommendation is that AI be checked, specifically the generative AI, because again, it depends on your model. For example, if someone has coded a model that is biased against people's skin tone, their, uh, their facial features, mm -hmm or their, the way that they appear, they could potentially put bad code, bad information into the large language models, and then it would take data and give an incorrect model. And that incorrect, incorrect model could affect people's credit. It could affect people's lending. It could affect people's identity. So the key thing is that whoever creates artificial intelligence, whatever company creates artificial intelligence, they have to stand by the information in which is generated from its programs. And that is the, the recommendations that scientists are giving to the Senate for their consideration. Wow, I did not know any of this. This is crazy. I did not know. And so what about the children? You know, children who are using AI and parents, should they be concerned, uh, especially with all these devices now that kids are using? This is a great question. A, a lot of people don't know that children's brains do not know how to completely problem solve and make decisions until the age of 25. Did you know oh, that? I, no, I, I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, that's the reason why car insurance goes down at the age of 25, because mm -hmm. when someone it turns 25, their frontal brain lobes develop and they're better at making effective decisions. It's yeah. the frontal brain lobes that is responsible for your executive mind. And that is the part that turns on, that allows you to make great decisions. So you plan your life and make the decisions that you want to move forward. Wow, I didn't but know that. <laughs> if someone's experiencing fear, this part doesn't work. And if someone's a child, this part is developing. So what artificial intelligence does is it generates information, but it depends on the information that's put into the large language model. If the information that's put into the large language model is not good information, then bad information comes out. So if kids who do not have the frontal brain lobe completely developed yet, mm -hmm. if they see bad information come out, they will not know that it's not accurate. So that's a basic type of concept that is seen in safety procedures with kids hopefully learn. Mm -hmm. Now, if that, if incorrect information is put into an artificial intelligence model and a video is created from false information that tells kids to put water on a grease fire, that would be dangerous. Mm -hmm. There could be artificial intelligence videos that are created from false information that's seen online. Not everything that you see online is accurate. Right. Actually, a right. good percentage of information that you see online is not accurate. If false information is placed into the model, false information comes out of the model. Mm -hmm. So if kids are looking at information and videos and, and information that's generated from artificial intelligence, from data that was inputted that was inaccurate, their young brains will not be able to know that it's fake information. Got it. Got it. So our job as adults is to ensure that kids are safe. If I was a parent, I would not have my child use artificial intelligence yet. 
And I would say that for three different reasons. I believe artificial intelligence, everyone's going to use it at some point in time, but it's really key for us to understand how artificial intelligence is being generated and being used and which companies are safe with our data before we hand something over to a child exactly. or to a teen. Uh, I would hold off because number one, sometimes kids will not know that it's inappropriate to use artificial intelligence for tests and for homework. That's number one. Yeah. We want to be able to help kids learn information, learn how to read books and learn information in the traditional way. And then when they turn to technology, they'll be able to reference what it is that they've learned, not the other way around. And the second reason is that child's, a child's brain takes time to develop. If we can develop the child's brain and help them make decisions at an early age to be able to reference and cross-check information to in to see if the information is accurate that would be giving our children and the next generation a chance to be able to have a discerning mind so their frontal brain lobes grow at a at a rate in which is going to be healthy for them and the third reason i would kind of hold off is that adults can use artificial intelligence and pose as kids right so it's really a safety concern mm -hmm. because we don't want our kids interacting with someone else who is using artificial intelligence to create a fake image of themselves to pose as a child. I so that. I truly believe that we as a society can really oversee how this technology is used to keep kids safe. That those were amazing tips as a parent. Like, you know, those are things we definitely have to be concerned about. I want to also dive into, you know, the entertainment industry, a lot of, you know, artificial intelligence, people using artist voice and things like that, creating songs. Um, that's been very trendy uh, within these past couple of months of this year, even recently. So what are the pros and cons for the entertainment industry? And where do you see that going? What are your predictions? Oh, that's a great, great question. Yeah. There are are so many concerns with artificial intelligence and entertainment. I mean, you can write pages and pages and pages of lists of concerns with entertainment and artificial intelligence. So we could be here for days. Yeah. Let's focus on, <laughs> let's focus on three aspects. Mm -hmm. The first aspect is there's artist voices that are being used incorrectly in generative AI. And the artists own their voices. It's called intellectual property. Somebody's voice is what they own. Somebody's face is what they have. Those types of parts to a person is a part of their branding, what makes them themselves, right. what gives them the opportunity to be in the media and be branded as, let's say, Jennifer Lopez or, or Oprah or, or, uh, uh, Sean Mendez girls <laughs> are people who are known for their face, for their voice, for their brand. If you take that and allow it to be used in these large language models to have someone else generate content from that, that's a huge concern because yeah. the artists themselves are not getting work or income from their own intellectual property, which is their face, their voice, their brand. The second thing that is a concern with artificial intelligence is trademarks and intellectual property. Mm -hmm. During the during the use of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence is downloaded on your computer. It also goes on your cell phone. And the artificial intelligence looks for patterns in your data. It looks for patterns online in data looks for patterns on your documents on your computer it looks for patterns in text messages and uh -huh. <laughs> information on your cell phone because remember the large language models are training themselves based on the patterns it sees so if it's seeing patterns on your computer with private messaging <laughs> if it's seeing uh information on your text it could be taking out u.s trademark or U.S. copyrighted material and putting it into something else that is not trademarked. 
So we have to be really careful about how artificial intelligence is used and what computers it's used on. And we have to be able to talk with the computer companies to flag out information which should not be used within the large language large language models. There's humans behind all of this coding. Right. Create the large language models. It's not like the robots are going off on their own. <laughs> no, that's that's right. not what's happening. There's humans like myself, like you, mm -hmm. who are going in and creating the mathematical models to look at the patterns for these large language models to work. All it takes is for somebody to create policies to say the large language model cannot access X, Y, and Z. Right. And, and we move on. And the third thing in, uh, in entertainment is the writers and the uh, entertainers with the actors. Mm. Now, every single entertainer, professional entertainer, when they're professional, they operate from a contract. Right. This contract identifies what type of um, ways in which somebody's voice, someone's uh, someone's image could be used. There are no contracts yet identifying how artificial intelligence is to be used or not used for actors, actresses, wow. entertainers. And that is causing a huge concern across the entire entertainment industry because there's no, currently right now, there's no regulatory agency to create laws on how artificial intelligence should be used. Right. Therefore, the lawyers at every single entertainment company are like in limbo. They have no clue what type of policy they should generate when there's no federal or national policy to how artificial intelligence should wow. be used. So because of that, we're seeing the writer's strike. We're seeing a potential um, SAG strike because there isn't one of the aspects of these continuing negotiations and talks in, in these organizations is the use of this artificial intelligence. Because there's no policy governing body to regulate how and when people's information could be used, especially in contracts with production, yeah. it's at a standstill. So I have faith that there's going to be leaders within the entertainment industry and leaders within uh, the artificial intelligence world to create models and create policies surrounding the proper use of data. I, I'm a person who's an optimist yeah. and really truly believe that humans can create solutions that are going to be helpful for everyone. And I truly believe that we are seeing with any new technology, it being rolled out and we're finding out what's not working. Right. Any new technology, the part that allows it to work effectively and efficiently is when there's communications and structures created to alter how the technology works so it's safe for everyone. I love that. I just want to say thank you so much for like educating me. I'm like so intrigued. I'm like, this is so much information that I just did not know about. So thank you. And I'm pretty sure my viewers are going to think the same thing when they listen to this and watch this. So where can people follow you? What is next for you? I know you have your podcast. Uh, kind of just tell a little of our viewers where they can follow you. Oh, that is so great. I I love sharing science, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm passionate about it. <laughs> oh my God, I love science. So you can find me on AnswersUnleashed.com and you can watch so many different videos from my TED Talk, Reprogramming Your Brain to Overcome Fear, uh, to my other TED Talks that I gave. Uh, at California State University, Northridge, and my TED Talk that I gave to artificial intelligence coders, they're all on AnswersUnleashed.com, and you can check out my books and videos and podcasts there. And if you want to find out more about me, you can go to OlympiaLapointe.com. Reach out anytime. I speak at organizations. I deliver and give messages based on my books. And I love, love sharing science so people understand it, so they create innovation. 
Thank you so much. It's your girl, Bianca B. Make sure you guys follow me on Instagram and Twitter at it's Bianca B at Bianca B Show. Thank you guys so much.